How's it going, guys? It's Rod C. at the WWE Monday Night Raw review from December 3rd. The first Raw of December. We are counting down. We are only a couple weeks away from ending 2018. Man, it's crazy how time flies. Isn't it? How crazy it is. But yeah, enough talk. Let's get right into the review. So Raw starts off, of course, with a 10-bell salute. To honor the memory of George H.W. Bush. Bush. Nah, Bush. I, I can't believe I actually botched his goddamn name. That's an automatic fail for myself. But anyway, George H.W. Bush, who passed away earlier last week. May he rust in peace. I think he was uh, 94? Yeah, yeah, I think he was 94. Close to that. So yes, rest easy, H.W., we at least loved you better than we loved good old George W. Bush. But rest in peace. Of course, though, after that, we played the WWE, a little WWE intro, then now forever, etc., etc., etc. You get the idea. So, first match we have to start off tonight, we have a women's tag team match. Ronda Rousey and Natalia face Nia Jax and Tamina. Now, before the match could start, the Riot Squad's music would hit. they come out with a table. While Ronda and Natalia were distracted, Tamina and Naya would attack Ronda and Natalia to take advantage of the distraction for pre-match assault. So both of them would attack Ronda and Natalia. Naya and Tamina would mainly go after Ronda while the Riot Squad goes after Natalia. So Naya would then hit a leg drop on Ronda. And also to start that attack, um, Tamina hit a super kick on Ronda. And Ronda also got thrown in the barricade and some steel steps. So the night hits the leg drop on Ronda. The White Riot Squad would hit a super kick power bomb combo through the tape through a table that they brought out off the apron. Natalia would then end up being injured from it, but Alexa would ensure Ronda later on the night that Alexa would reschedule the match to happen later on, and Ronda would have to find her own home partner. But then, but that is for later on. For now. Next segment. So, and of course, so the initial match is ruled in no contest since the battle never rain. But we will have a rematch later on tonight, and Ronda will have a new partner. So, continuing on. Next up, we get a segment. Alexa Bliss will come out to the rain. Of course, Alexa says she will give the best women's action possible to the fans. Bullshit. We've heard that one before. We've heard that one before. It's the, I will give the fans the best competition possible cliche. So, of course, Alexa decides to host another open forum with Sasha and Bailey Because it didn't work last week. And, of course, WWE. This is the purest example of WWE doing the same shit over and over again. Before your very eyes. The definition of insanity. It didn't work last week. Let's try it again. So Bailey and Sasha come out. Of course, to start off, Bailey asks how many questions will it take before Dana, Mickey, and Alicia attack Bailey and Sasha again. But Alexa ensured that those three would not attack. So let's get to the questions. Question number one from a nice gentleman named Zach. Zach asks. How does Bailey deal with the comments on social media with Sasha using Bailey? Sasha, of course, tells Zach he should ask that question to Corey Graves. But that will probably not happen because Corey Graves is too busy kissing PC Corbin's ass. And being a goddamn puppet for him. But of course, Sasha says that she and Bailey will always be best friends. I call double bullshit on that. The Sasha heel turn is coming. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. So, question number two. We did not know what this fine lady's name was that asked this question. Today she asked if Bailey and Sasha could wrestle any female from any generation. Who would it be? Bailey and Sasha both answered by saying Trish and Lita. At WrestleMania. Yes, I got some new photos on the wall, by the way. This photo right here is my photo out from Niagara Falls Comic Con with Trisha as Alita. Can't really see it that well because of the white. He also got the Big Show one up there, the Michael Rooker one, and the Ric Flair one. Just thought I should point that out real quick. 
But yes, let's continue on. So next up, we get a question from another gentleman named Clay. Clay also says he's from Houston. Just so he could get that cheap pop from the crowd. Ah, oh, he must be a John Cena fan, going for the cheap pop. He has learned well from that master's asshole. So Clay asks, If Bailey and Sasha could have any superpower, what would it be? God damn, this is the exact same fucking segment as last week. Just his questions are more stupider than before. Um, both Bailey and Sasha say they would, if they could, they would have the power to make Alexa disappear. So then, question number four from another lady in the crowd. By the way, all of these question people are all sitting front row and floor. So this lady asks. What changes will be made to the women's division in 2019? Ah, of course, 2019. Next year. Because, you know, we're building toward 2019. The big year. Because there are some big changes coming to the company. And remember that predictions video I did in December last year? What was one of those predictions I said? I said major changes. The company will be in so bad a shape. That major changes will be coming to the company in, by the end of 2018 going into 2019. Yeah, so far, so far that one's well on the path to being correct. How about that? I So I guess I got another prediction right in that video. And oh, by the way, in a couple weeks, mainly after TLC, I will be releasing that prediction, my prediction video results, and we're going to see how bad I did. But yeah, so yeah, get back on track. So the change is coming to the vision. Well, Bailey and Sasha say they both want to become the first Raw Women's Tag Team Champions. Thanks for a spoiler, dumb shits. You couldn't keep that a secret any longer. You just had to spoil it. Well, there you go, folks. It's been spoiled. The Women's Tag Team titles are coming in 2019. Raw and SmackDown. So then that's when Dana, Mickey, and Alicia Fox would come out. Of course, Alexa's saying that this show will not end up as last week. So then Alexa decides to make an impromptu match between Bailey and Sasha Banks against the team of Mickey James and Alicia Fox with Dana Brooke at Wayne Rainside. So we come back from commercial break. The match started during commercial break, so there's no meaning to it. So highlights and Alicia fails in the match. Well, Alicia's Northern Lights suplex is actually pretty decent. I'll give a, I'll give her kudos there. Alicia's big boot to her own partner is a double fail. Like, she has to have better rain awareness, stupid idiot. Um, Alicia's selling throughout the match was garbage. It was either she was not selling it properly or she was overselling it. Um, Sasha's drop kick was good. Mickey's roundhouse was well on point. Um, Bailey's back suplex to Alicia Fox is good. Match ending, Sasha hits the backstabber. Bailey hits the Bailey to belly. Bailey gets the three count for the win. Eh, pretty boring match. Pretty bad start to the show. Sorry, I got a little corn kernel in my mouth, sir. So continuing on after that, we come back from commercial. So then we air a video package of Baron Corbin's rise to power as he gets ready to Become the new Raw General Manager after TLC. Wait, Braun Strowman might be coming back? Even with the elbow surgery? No, I refuse to believe that. I can't believe that. That's fake news. That's fake news. There's no way Braun will be back in time. I refuse to hear that. So next up, we were going to get a rich. We had one-on-one -on -one match between what looked like Kalisto versus Scott Dawson. Of the Revival. Because before the match, Scott Dawson and the Revival, of course, were whining about how... How they aren't ready for Lucha House Party and that Lucha House Party doesn't respect tradition. So then Scott Dawson decided that... If they don't respect tag team tradition, maybe they'll respect one-on-one -on -one tradition. So as Scott gets in the rain, it's then announced that the match is now under Lucha House Rules. So it's now a three-on-one handicap match. Oh, great. More Lucha House rules. Fuck, are we gonna ever have a match where the Lucha House part rules will not go in effect? 
Can we have one match where that doesn't happen? That's all I ask for. So, highlights of the match. Grant's Grandma to weeks drop kick fall by a body slam was good along with Scott's leg drop into an elbow drop. Um, Wednesday super kick was good along with diving close body crossbody. Match ending. Kalisto hits the Selena da Sol. Gron hits the Swanton. Grandma to week gets the three count for the win. So yeah, another boring match. Pretty flat start to the show. So next up we get another segment. This is the Drew McIntyre appreciation night segment. So, of course, to start this segment, we have General Manager-elect PC Corbin in the ring. Of course, Baron saying that with the help of Drew, he was able to eliminate some thorns in his side. Those thorns being the Shield, Kurt Angle, Finn Bauer, and Braun Strowman. And, of course, Drew McIntyre says that after TLC, Baron will become permanent Raw General Manager. So then Drew McIntyre, so then Drew plays a video package of Drew's highlights ever since his return to WWE. And then after that, Drew McIntyre comes out. So Drew gets in the rain. Baron, of course, starts it off by presenting Drew with a gold medal of excellence as a thank you to him. Of course, Drew says that he's thankful for it. And of course, Drew says that he did what nobody would do in, this ro in the roster. And Jen Drew says that everybody wants to play video games and be on their phones backstage nowadays. And then Drew says that he's shaping the Raw roster in his image to talent who give 150%. And of course, Drew's shape, so he's shaping in his world. So then Drew says that Finn Bauer is a boy in a man's world. And then that's when Dolph Ziggler would come out. So, of course, Dolph comes out. Dolph asks, of course, where, his where was his invitation? And, of course, Drew said that Dolph was never invited to the ceremony. And then Drew says that Dolph doesn't meet Drew's height requirements. Oh, because Drew's goddamn tall. Of course, Drew says that he is the whole damn package. And then Drew says Dolph's job was just to get him to a prominent role on the main roster. So then Drew asks Dolph to leave the ring. Dolph refuses. And then Drew says Dolph should be kissing his feet. And then Drew, said, Drew says he's the reason Dolph has been relevant for the first time in a decade. Um, I, I'm gonna, I disagree with that. Um, Dolph had a pretty good run in 2016, the second half. After the draft, he had that pretty good run the second half of 2018. So I'm going to raise my hand to that. So then Dolph attacks Drew McIntyre and then lays out Drew with a six tag. But as Dolph's leaving the ring, Baron Corbin says makes an impromptu match between Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler. Because as you know, that's not PC. So we come back from the match, starts during commercial, so it obviously means nothing. God damn, two matches already in the show that starting commercial. God, we're off to a bad start. So highlights the match. Dolph's headbutt was good, along with Drew's single leg. Drew's slingshot was also good, along with his overhead suplex. Um, Drew then Drew then grabs a microphone and then says he's going to pretend that Dolph Ziggler is Finn Bauer. And then really attacks him. And then that's when Finn Bauer would come out to the ring to watch. So then Drew hits a reverse Alabama slam. Michael Pohl, of course, calling it a Alabama slam. No, Michael Pohl, you dumbass. It's a reverse Alabama slam. Because Drew is throwing him into the mat face first. A normal Alabama slam would be back first into the mat. A reverse one is face first. No, your damn moves right, Michael Pohl. Do I have to do your goddamn job for you? So continuing on. Dolph, Dolph's DDT was also good along with his axe handle off the apron. Actually, that was a botch he sort of missed Drew. It's rare to see a botch like that. God damn, we're off to a bad start. The match is actually looking pretty decent. But that botch really put it downhill. Um, Drew's Glasgow kiss headbutt was good. Um, Drew slam onto the barricade, making sure Dolph's Ziggler slanted onto the barricade. So then, match in. So, key point in the match. Drew would throw to Dolph into the official. 
So we have referee knocked down a crucial point in match cliche. Finn Balor would hit a missile drop kick on the Drew into the barricade. Drew would beat the ref's 10 count, though, at not the game the ran at 9. But as Drew gets in the ring, Dolph hits the super kick. Dolph Ziggler gets the 3 count for the win. So with a assist from Finn Balor, Dolph beats Drew on Drew McIntyre Appreciation Night. Uh-oh, PC Corbin's gonna be pissed. We'll have to see how this goes. But continuing on. Next up, we get Elias in the ring. Of course, Elias doing his normal concert theme. Elias then says that, of course, doing the Who Wants to Walk with Elias theme. WWE stands for Walk with Elias, etc., etc., etc. Of course, Elias says that Bobby is harder to find in Houston than Carmel Carmelo Anthony. Uh, because Carmelo, Carmelo Anthony is usually injured or he's not irrelevant in games. I get you, Elias. I get you. So then Elias says that Bobby is afraid of the living truth. So then Elias starts to do a guitar solo. As he starts, Leo Rush would then come out with Bobby Lashley. And Leo says that the spotlight belongs on Bobby. And Leo has Bobby doing bodybuilder poses. With the last one being Bobby Lashley showing off his ass. And also having Bobby slap his ass. Slap his ass. To tell everyone, including Elias, to kiss Bobby's ass. So then Elias gets out of the ring. And a brawl starts on the stage. Elias will get the upper hand by throwing Bobby into the stage ribbons. The entrance board, you get the idea. So then Elias would chase Bobby backstage with a guitar. Elias would come back out with the guitar. And then, when the assists from Finn Bauer again... Because Leo was going to leave backstage. But Finn Balor was able to bring Leo back out. So with the assist, Elias will then strike Leo with the guitar. Uh-oh, that's not going to fly with PC Corbin. Wait, wait, wait. I know what's going to happen next week. PC Corbin's going to get pissed. He's going to pump his chest about how what Elias do was unacceptable. And he's going to get triggered. Triggered. And then Baron, PC Corbin, is going to call the cops on Elias. And have Elias arrested for child abuse. And then he's also going to have Finn Bauer arrest, arrested for accomplicing Elias. Because that's not PC. Fuck, I think I may have just spoiled the show next week. But yeah, continuing on. Next up, we get a one-on-one -on -one match. We get Bobby Roode versus Drake Maverick. Drake Maverick, the manager of AOP. And if Bobby Roode wins, Roode and Gable get a future Raw Tag Team title shot against AOP. So highlights the match right at the start as Bobby is attack is beating down Drake. Um, we then get a scene backstage of AOP attacking Chad Gable backstage. Since AOP and Gable were both banned from ringside. So then once the refs come out to break, come backstage to break it up, Barrett PC Corbin comes out, and then PC announces that the match is now actually a three-on-two handicap match. So then, really quickly, Bobby Roode will then go for the glorious DDT on Drake Maverick. He hit it, but AOP would get out there in time to break up the pin. Uh, Chad Gable would also get out too, but it would be not be enough. AOP would hit the sidewalk slam, followed by the stomp. AOP would also hit an atomic drop big boot to Gable. Match ending, AOP would hit the super colliders. But Drake Maverick demands to get tagged, so he gets tagged in. Drake gets the three count for the win. So Drake Maverick gets the win for AOP. How many times can you say that? But continuing on, next up. <clears throat> this week on Unsolved Mysteries. We try and find out why Dean Ambrose turned on Seth Rollins. So this week, as Dean Ambrose is getting ready to come out to address the WWE Universe, six security guards will come out with gas masks on. And then Dean Ambrose will come out with gas masks with a siren playing with his theme music. This might be his new theme music, maybe. But the sirens are playing and he's wearing a gas mask. 
That can only mean one thing. Houston, we have a problem. Bad down the hatches because the nukes are coming. Oh, God, the carnage is going to be crazy. So, of course, Dean first speaks in his mask by Dean saying that you can't be safe in a terrible place like Houston. And Dean says he has his guards protecting Dean from any Houston diseases that Houston fans may carry. Then Dean takes off the mask and starts talking like a normal person. So then Dean says the guards are protecting Dean from Seth, because the last time Dean came out to address the crowd, Seth attacked him. That was at least two weeks ago. So then Dean says that Seth is needy and insecure. And then Dean says Seth needs to have everything go his way. And he always has to be right and that Seth is a control freak. And then Dean says the WWE Universe has weak characters like Seth. I mean, Dean's not wrong. Because most of the WWE fan base today like to lower their standards. And most of them really have no goddamn standards. Like, he's not that far off. I gotta agree with Dean on that one. So then Dean says that Roman, Seth, and boring fuckface Roman Reigns only cared about being role models in the Shield. Instead of being, a, being what they were like back in the days. Yes, the days of 2013 and 2014. When the Shield wrecked havoc on the entire roster. And then Dean says he's the last one in the company with integrity. And then Dean calls himself the moral compass of WWE. And then Dean says the Houston kids may not be able to learn about that since the Houston school system sucks ass. Those aren't my words, those were Dean Ambrose's words. So then Dean says Seth will drop the ball at TLC. And then Dean says that precious Intercontinental Championship will fall right into his hands. The hands of the moral compass. And then that's when Seth Rollins would come out from the crowd and attack the security guards. So then Seth and Dean would go and brawl in the crowd. But Dean would get the upper hand when Seth would go for an axe handle off the barricade. Back to the raid side area, but Dean would hit Seth with a gas mask. So then Dean hits the dirty deeds on Seth onto the concrete floor. But Dean then tells the six guards to take Seth and throw his ass into the ring. And then Dean gets in the ring and then hits a second dirty deeds on Seth. And Dean Ambrose is standing tall. So with no answers in sight ahead of their T instead of ahead of their match at TLC. This thus concludes another episode of Unsolved Mysteries. We now return to our regularly scheduled programming. <coughs> Alright. So next up we get a one on one match. We get Heath Slater versus Rhino and Per Baron Corbin. The, the, the winner of this match gets to stay on Raw. While the loser gets fired. Because the Baron Corbin was doing some number crunching ahead of his big and ahead of Corbin becoming the general manager elect. And Baron wanted to have keep Heath and Rhino. But there was one problem. Raw doesn't have the cap space for e for both of them. So one of them had to go to make up space. Monday Night Raw, welcome to the high-speed dynamite factory known as Cap Hill. You can add to the roster, and you can't really do anything else. So, um, so I guess this means Lars Zolvin may be going to SmackDown? Well, part of the reason they're in Cap Hill is because of Brock Lesnar's contract. Even though Brock Lesnar barely fucking shows up. He only shows up when the goddamn price is right. And he also got Roman Reigns' contract. But Roman... But Roman is not even here because he has leukemia. And he's still getting treatments. From last I checked, he still got... He still threw his first week of treatments. If anyone wants to know. No real updates since then. But yes, yeah, so, um, no highlights in this match. Uh, match ending, Heath would hit the neckbreaker on Rhino... Heath gets the three count for the win. But I know what you're thinking. Does this mean Heath is going to become a jobber? Not so fast. 
Because backstage during commercial break, we will find out that Baron announces Heath will now be a WWE referee from now on. And enhance Heath a shirt. Oh no, so now Heath is part of the Zebra show. Oh god, this won't end badly at all. Nope, not at all. So continuing on, next up we get another Trash Heat match. We get Finn Bauer versus Jobber Mahal. Well, any match with Jobber Mahal, you know is automatically gonna suck. So highlights and Jobber Mahal fails in the match. Jobber's shoulder tackles in the corner looked better, but they still sucked. He's still taking too goddamn long between tackles. It's tackle, pause, tackle, pause. At least the pausing looks quicker now. But it still sucks. Um, Jobber's selling throughout the match looked like crap. Jobber's toss into the ropes looked terrible. Reckless. Had no control. Jobber's headlock looked like crap. Set that Finn could Finn could easily get out of it. Finn's double step, double leg into a stump was good along with a step up in Zaguri. Um, Finn's sling blade and missile drop kick was, all, was also good. Key moment in the match. Same brothers would distract Finn Bauer when Seth was going for the coup de gras. Apollo Crews would then come out to take out both same brothers. John Mahal would then lay out Apollo Crews with a big boot which looked like shit. Finn Bauer would then hit a front flip dive. So then Finn gets John Mahal back in the ring, excuse me. Finn Bauer would hit a missile drop kick in the corner again, a second one. And then Finn would hit the coup de gras. Finn gets the three count for the win. This match sucked ass. But backstage after commercial break, while Finn was being interviewed, Drew McIntyre would then in a co attack Finn Bauer backstage, throwing him into a couple of keg stands. Or keg barrels. Take your pick, LOL. Which me and of course at TLC, Drew will go one on one with Finn Bauer. And Bobby Lashley will also go one on one with Elias. In the final pay per view of 2018. So continuing on, next up we get to our main event. So we have Ronda Rousey and her new and our new partner, Ember Moon, versus Nia Jackson Tamina. So before the match, as Ember Moon's music starts to play, Nia and Tamina would attack Ronda Rousey for pre-match assault. Again. So then Ember Moon has to run out to the rain instead of doing her normal entrance to come out to come to the aid. Ember and Ronda would then force Nia and Tamina out of the rain. So the matchup starts during commercial break. So highlights. Um, Nia's beal throw looked a bit reckless. I think she could have controlled that better. Ember's arm drag was good along with Ronda's single leg. Ember's inverted face buster was good along with Tamina's super kick. Ember's jawbreaker was good along with her Hurricane Ronda and Nia Jax. Uh, Tamina's diving headbutt looked a bit bot. She completely missed Ember. Uh, I guess this is what happens when you team with Nia Jax. So then, another key point in the match, Ember would then, Tamina would then accidentally take out her own partner, Nia Jax, with a clothesline. Meant for Ember Moon, but Ember rolled out of the way. Ember would then hit it in Sagiri. Ronda would come in. She lay a couple punches, strikes on Tamina, which looked good. So then Ronda would then demand for Nia to be tagged in. Nia gets tagged in. Then Nia takes, her, takes Tamina back in. So then Ronda grabs Nia and then throws her, does a judo throw over the top rope to Nia. So you made Ronda look very strong. You may have all but killed the build up to it because you now see that Nia is nowhere close in Ronda's league. So, um, another highway down. Ronda's insecurity into a stomp was good. It looked like Ronda was about to botch, but she turned the botch into a good move. A good counter to it. So Ronda's doing heads up here. So match ending. Ronda hits a judo throw. Ember hits the eclipse on Tamina. Ronda walks in the arm bar of Tamina for the tap out. So Ronda and Ember are victorious. And we are two weeks away from TLC. And that's how we end Monday Night Raw. Actually a long review this week. Because we're closing up on 30 minutes. God damn. But yeah. I think I addressed everything in this episode. Pretty trash episode. 
Nothing really happened. It was boring. Like, nothing really happened for three hours. Like, it sucked. Another terrible show. So, final rating. Two out of ten, my final rating. Raw looked like shit once again. Terrible booking. You get the whole picture. Raw has been terrible like it has been every goddamn week in 2018. Actually, there were a couple decent episodes, but that was it. But yeah, I think I ran on about Raw long enough. But yeah, that's all I gotta say. Hope everyone has a great day. Let's hope Raw is better next week. We can all dream, damn it. Peace out.